Okay, crisis averted. The hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Good morning, and welcome to today's hearing entitled Ocean Exploration, Diving to New Depths and Discoveries. The committee is holding this hearing at the beginning of World Oceans Month and Capitol Hill Ocean Week to celebrate the oceans and the wonders that they hold. I would like to welcome and thank all of our witnesses for being here today to discuss the state of our oceans and the importance of ocean exploration to the United States. I wanna let the witnesses know that my colleagues and I are going to have to leave for votes around 10 a.m., actually on four bills that address ocean acidification uh, that passed out of this committee last month. So in order to get to witness testimony and questions as quickly as possible, Ranking Member Marshall and I are going to keep our opening statements short. I request to submit my full statement for the record. As we've discussed, in this subcommittee, this Congress, the oceans are incredibly important for sustaining life on Earth, regulating the Earth's climate, supplying over half the oxygen we breathe, providing a major source of protein for billions of people around the planet, and more. Human health is intricately connected to ocean health. We live on a blue planet. The oceans cover 71% of our planet, and yet we've mapped about 15% of the seafloor. Human eyes have seen less than 5% of it. While we have sent 12 people to the moon, only four have gone to the deepest part of the ocean. The ocean is the Earth's final frontier. Yesterday, we held a hearing on biodiversity loss and heard about the rapid rate at which the oceans are changing through climate change, ocean acidification, pollution, overfishing, and more. The clock is ticking. At today's hearing, I look forward to a discussion with our distinguished, ex distinguished panel of experts, innovators, and explorers on how we can advance the pace of ocean exploration and dive to deeper depths and discovery for a better future. I also note that the Science Committee is hosting its first ever Ocean Exploration Expo tomorrow morning at 9.30, which some of our panelists and many other groups from the ocean exploration community will showcase their cutting edge technology, work, and discoveries. This will be an amazing and fun educational opportunity, and I encourage those who can to attend. I will now recognize Ranking Member Marshall for an opening statement. Thank you for holding this hearing, Chairwoman Fletcher. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing before this subcommittee and sharing their perspectives. Though we are known more for wheat, cattle, and ethanol production, Kansans are affected every day by our oceans. Weather and climate patterns are one direct impact, but other indirect impacts such as energy production, international trade routes, shipping our exports, as well as recreation and tourism opportunities affect Kansans daily. All Americans benefit from a better understanding of our oceans, whether we live on a farm in western Kansas or a coastal community along the ocean. June is National Ocean Month, and it's fitting we hold this hearing recognizing the importance of researching this part of our planet, which has gone largely unexplored. Over 70% of our planet is covered by water, and more than 96% of that water is in our oceans. There are more than 13,000 miles of United States coastline and 3.4 million nautical square miles within our nation's territorial jurisdiction. However, NOAA estimates that only 35% of the ocean water adjacent to the U.S. has been explored with modern technology. A recent proclamation from the White House notes that our oceans, along with the Great Lakes, generate more than $320 billion in economic activity annually. As part of NOAA's fiscal year 20. Uh, budget submission, Acting Administrator Dr. Neil Jacobs named the development of the blue economy one of his top priorities. Having a better understanding of our oceans is an important component of promoting economic development, whether it's ensuring a st strong fisheries economy, international trade, recreation and tourism, or energy exploration. We all benefit from ocean exploration. Scientific research is an important aspect of ocean exploration. We will hear from our witnesses today how discoveries from research conducted related to our oceans can positively impact medical research, cleaner energy production, and even the development of spacesuits. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses how this committee can help promote research for our oceans. In January 2018, President Trump signed an executive order to advance ocean-related scientific research and promote greater coordination between federal agencies and ocean partnerships. This committee should ensure that universities, private companies, and nonprofit groups can continue the mission of increasing our knowledge of our oceans for the benefit of our country. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. 
And at this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness, Dr. Katie Croft Bell, is the founding director of the Ocean Institute. Ocean, of the Open Ocean Initiative and a research scientist at the MIT Media Lab. Her background is in deep sea exploration, and since 1999, she has led or participated in more than 25 oceanographic and archaeological projects. In 2001, she was a John A. Naus Marine Policy Fellow in the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration. At the Ocean Exploration Trust, she was Chief Scientist of the Nautilus Exploration Program. Dr. Bell received her BS in Ocean Engineering from MIT, her Master's in Maritime Archaeology from the University of Southampton, and her PhD in Geological Oceanography from the University of Rhode Island. Our second witness, Dr. Dr. Carly Weiner, is the Director of Marine Communications at the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Previously, she held the position of Communications Manager for Centers for Ocean Science, Education, Excellence, Island Earth. And prior to that, she worked as the research and outreach specialist for the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Research Partnership at the University of Hawaii. She also hosted the monthly marine science radio show, All Things Marine, for six years. Dr. Weiner received her bachelor's degree in communications and her master's and doctorate degrees in environmental studies from York University in Toronto, Canada. Our third witness, Mr. Steve Barrett, is the senior vice president of business development at Oceaneering International, Inc., Previously, he served as Senior Vice President of Subsea Product Lines at Oceaneering International. Mr. Barrett has more than 30 years of experience working in the oil and gas industry, starting in 1980. In 1982, he joined FMCA Technologies, Inc., where he progressed from design engineer to his most recent role as Global Director of Subsea Services. Mr. Barrett holds a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Texas A&M University and an MBA in Finance and Entrepreneurship from Rice University. Our final witness is Mr. David Lang, the co-founder and vice president of business development and outreach for So Far Ocean Technologies. In 2011, Mr. Lang co-founded Open Rove, which pioneered low-cost underwater drone designs. Open Rove merged with another company in 2019 to form So Far. Now, the mission of the company is to create pervasive sensor networks to understand and monitor ocean environments and provide critical data for ocean enthusiasts, industry, and conservation. Mr. Lang received his Bachelor's of Business Administration from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Each witness will have five minutes for their spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you've completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. And we will begin with Dr. Bell. Excuse me. Chairwoman Fletcher, Ranking Member Marshall, members of the Environment Subcommittee, and members of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, thank you for this opportunity to testify on the importance and future of ocean exploration. The deep ocean, below 200 meters, is the largest ecosystem on our planet, supporting life for every human on Earth. The ocean provides most of the oxygen we breathe, supplies food for billions of people, supports a trillion dollar global ocean economy, nourishes our souls, and astonishes us with its wonders. In turn, we are impacting the deep sea at an unprecedented rate, increasing greenhouse gas emissions, pollution, extraction industries, and more. And yet we only have a rudimentary understanding of the ocean's role in our survival. We are at a critical point where we may be irreparably impacting the deep sea without truly understanding what those impacts may be. In 2000, an expert panel led by Dr. Marsha McNutt published the report of the President's Panel on Ocean Exploration. The distinguished group of academic, industry, and government leaders called for the establishment of a federal ocean exploration program to map the physical, geological, biological, chemical, and archaeological aspects of the ocean, funded at $75 million a year. Within months, the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration was created, funded at $4 million, and has seen a maximum of $42 million just this year in FY19. If high-risk research like exploration is underfunded or unstable, agencies will tend to invest in safe bets that result in incremental progress, rather than riskier but potentially transformative endeavors that can truly change the future, enhance our understanding of the ocean, and ensure U.S. leadership. Today, deep sea exploration sits at a crossroads. We could continue making incremental progress, or we could invest in new technologies, research methods, and social systems to transform and accelerate discovery for the 21st century. I believe that America is better served with the latter. 
To do so, we must first maximize the efficiency of discovery. Current practices focus on large ship-based equipment, which affords spectacularly detailed observations, like the ones you see here, but only on hyper-focused spatial and temporal scales, and at a very expensive rate. To truly maximize our investment, we should leverage economies of scale to dramatically decrease the cost of sensors and systems by orders of magnitude to significantly increase the amount of area and volume of the ocean that we can explore. Develop data systems, standards, archiving, access, and advanced analysis to fully understand data at new scales in an integrated way. And innovate across the spectrum of an exploration by applying advances from other industries to ocean challenges and creating a responsive environment in which to deploy and operationalize new tools to reestablish the United States as a global leader. Second, we must use these new tools to explore the world's undiscovered places. To be sure, the mandate to explore the entirety of the US exclusive economic zone is a significant challenge, but it is not enough. The ocean does not know boundaries, and it is an incredibly interconnected system from coastal communities to the high seas, the atmosphere, to the deep sea trenches. We therefore must view ocean exploration as a global imperative, not a national one, to achieve something greater than we could ever do alone. And finally, we must lead a global community of explorers. Traditionally, exploration is conducted by those with advanced degrees and access to costly equipment, limiting the number and diversity of people involved in the enterprise. To fully explore and understand our vast oceans, however, we need to work outside the traditional structures. One strategy for thinking beyond our current model is to build new bridges with communities who have not yet been invited into oceanographic exploration, including underrepresented communities within the US, as well as developing countries around the world. Instead of only an elite cadre of academics participating in ocean exploration, limiting the types and amount of work that we can do, we need to nurture new communities, build greater global capacity for exploration, and look for ideas and expertise in unexpected places. Creating a global program of ocean exploration is ambitious, but imperative, and will yield a significant return on investment with innumerable benefits to the United States and the world. To do so, we need to invest in high-risk research and development to maximize discovery, explore the world's undiscovered places, and lead a global community of explorers. By undertaking a long-term global strategy of ocean exploration, we will leverage all that we know and all that we will discover. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Weiner? Thank you, Chair Fletcher, Ranking Member Marshall, and the other distinguished members of the committee for holding this valuable hearing today and for giving me the esteemed privilege for providing testimony. It is an honor to be here to speak about the deep sea environment that is not often at the forefront of everyday citizens' thoughts about the ocean. Such vital systems like deep sea mounts, coral reefs, seeps, and other uh, deep systems provide scientific understanding, sharing, and consideration. I thank this committee for its efforts to facilitate discussion on a national level to address the significance of ocean exploration and continued need for collaboration, technology-based research. If you could start the slide, that would be great. It is my great pleasure to appear before you today in my current capacity as directing communications and outreach for Schmidt Ocean Institute, a 501c3 operating foundation established by Eric and Wendy Schmidt in 2009. Schmidt Ocean Institute is the only philanthropically funded international seagoing facility dedicated to year-round open ocean research and aims to foster a deep understanding of our ocean by combining advanced science with state-of-the-art technology. In my role, I share the exciting discoveries and important research that takes place on the Institute's research vessel, Falcor. A statistic we often hear is that we know more about the far side of the moon than about the ocean. But I personally think that the more important question to highlight here is why do we know more about the moon than we do about the deep sea? How do we create excitement and passion for the systems that we cannot view from the beach and bring understanding to the ocean health, about ocean health to America's heartland? Many observe the vastness of the ocean, but few comprehend the scale of the deep sea. However, technology is beginning to change this, not only giving access to these environments for research, but to share this exploration through live streaming video around the world. 
Technology that continues to advance the state of the ocean science in an area where more national focus needs to be allocated, allowing for broader and faster data collection, management, analysis, and open sharing. As our global ocean changes, we need to be able to capture baseline data for hard to reach places and understand how they will influence shallow environments. Unfortunately, available deep sea observations are discontinuous and it is not known how these ecosystems connect to each other or to the broader ocean food chain. One of the best ways to close this lack of understanding is through multidisciplinary, multinational partnerships. Schmidt Ocean Institute has endeavored to achieve this through unique collaborations that have had scientific and conservation implications. An example of this is in 2014, high resolution maps created off of research vessel Falkor for the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. These maps helped to illuminate seamounts that contributed to justification for expansion of the protected areas or of the newly discovered geological formations found in the Pescadero Basin last year that feature upside down mirror-like lakes that pool hot fluids. The work at this site will further allow investigation of the geological controls on habitat suitability for different animal communities. Better data monitoring and capacity will play a central role in improving exploration outcomes. This means not only implementing robust technologies in our own waters of North America, but expanding them globally to remote and developing countries. Robotic systems coupled with artificial intelligence can complement existing vessels and platforms. When deployed in groups, autonomous vehicles will improve coverage and cost efficiency for ocean observations. Schmidt Ocean Institute has focused on scalable ocean research, offering time at sea for developing and testing of robots and smart software for autonomous marine surveys. These types of projects allow scientists to make quick and well-informed decisions on how to directly sample and conduct fine-scale surveys. While we still have much to discover here on Earth, scientists are also looking to other oceans in our solar system. In preparation for such endeavors, deep ocean systems can serve as a laboratory to develop and test new technology for use in extraterrestrial exploration. Ocean exploration lends itself to interactive storytelling and engagement. Outreach programs should not only continue to be supported on a national level, but successful programs must be identified, expanded, and replicated across disciplines and locations. It is important to not just make data and imagery available, but to synthesize these materials for um, engaging widespread audiences. One example is Schmidt Ocean Institute's Artist at Sea program that has um, had many artists participate in science expeditions and share their art. It is a way to make data approachable and bring in new audiences to understand the ocean. The public faces daily messages of negativity surrounding our ocean. During this time of environmental decline, ocean exploration can provide a new narrative, bringing a message of hope by showcasing beautiful and mysterious parts of our ocean that are rarely observed to millions of people. The ocean is changing, but new data, science, and dedicated people can bring a fresh understanding and engagement to the deep sea. Thank you very much for inviting me to testify here today. Thank you, Dr. Weiner. Mr. Barrett? Chairwoman Fletcher, Ranking Member Marshall, and members of the committee, thank you for holding this very timely and important hearing and for the opportunity to provide one perspective on the future of ocean exploration. I'm very excited to be here today and to represent Oceaneering International and to share a seat at this table with some truly incredible co-panelists. Dr. Weiner's tremendous work as Communications Director at Schmidt Ocean Institute, where Schmidt continues to set the bar for getting ocean exploration to the forefront of the public. Dr. Bell's aggressive work to promote ocean exploration as a cornerstone in the field and the academic world and continues to set the example for others to join and em emulate. And uh, David Lang's innovative approach with open ROV and now so far ocean technologies and his engagement in ocean exploration and new ideas are bringing a new generation of ocean explorers to our world. Together, they are bringing us to new depths and discoveries. My written submitted remarks focus on how Oceaneering's history of innovation and technology development is helping shape the future of ocean exploration, particularly in the commercial ocean energy services and defense undersea sectors. 
Oceaneering continues to leverage technology, innovation, and expertise from its maritime, space, and robotics industry portfolios across both the commercial and defense domains to better support the current and future ocean of ocean exploration. Oceaneering has developed state-of-the-art work-class ROV technologies and currently is taking those to the next level of all-electric, resonant, with remote piloting for extended missions and building on those breakthrough technologies with our new Freedom Vehicle, combining extended electric deployment, work, and hovering capability with remote or autonomy in extended subsea survey, inspection, and maintenance missions. As Dr. Bell, I think, mentioned, uh, deploying assets, working offshore in marine environments is inherently very costly, as is developing new and improved technologies for ocean exploration. Obviously, no sector working alone can achieve all that is needed, and therefore, a better collaboration between government agencies, academics, nonprofits, and industry should be a priority. Better collaboration could potentially lower the inherent high cost of ocean data acquisition and expand the footprint of coverage. As Dr. Bell touched on, there must be better ways to leverage the utilization of existing vessels within industry activity, uh, such as transportation, offshore energy services, and fishing. And with that, we might be able to improve our collective ability to cost-effectively acquire more ocean data. Finally, to attract our best and brightest young minds who can tackle the technical cost, data acquisition, and data analytics challenges for ocean exploration, we need to make sure that industry, academia, and government are providing attractive and exciting new opportunities in the areas of ex ocean exploration. Many current and future technical and collaborative developments across the spectrum of ocean exploration are a key foundation to our collective challenge of reaching new depths and discoveries. Having a robust commercial sector partnerships and, partner and participants such as Oceaneering I believe can provide a force multiplier that complements the tremendous work of Drs. Weiner and Bell and in, of innovative new players in this area like David Lang of SOFAR Ocean Technologies. We all have critical roles to play, and with your committee's support, we look forward to our future and supporting ocean exploration. Chairwoman Fletcher, I look forward to engaging in discussion with you and the committee and to answering any questions that you or your committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Mr. Lang? Chairwoman Fletcher, Ranking Member Marshall, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity. I need to start with a disclaimer. I am not a formally trained scientist or engineer. My path to this hearing is unusual and worth explaining. It begins in an unexpected place, not a graduate school lab in Woods Hole or Monterey, not on a research vessel exploring the high seas, and not on a Navy battleship. It starts in 2011, my friend Eric Stackpole's garage in Cupertino, California. We were both in our mid-20s and underemployed. We were attempting to build an underwater remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, for as cheap as we possibly could, using only off-the-shelf parts we could buy on the internet. Our goal was to use the robot to explore an underwater cave in the Trinity Alps in Northern California, supposedly filled with gold from an abandoned heist during the gold rush. The story was an excuse for us to tinker with new technologies and honestly to have a little fun. After our unsuccessful but commendable expedition to find the gold, the project took on a life of its own. The effort was reported on by the New York Times, and we were overwhelmed with interest by others who wanted a similar affordable device. We launched a project on Kickstarter to sell our design as a DIY, build-it-yourself kit, and quickly sold more than we projected. Over the years, we grew out of the garage to become one of the largest volume ROV manufacturers in the world, pioneering new designs and most recently merging with another company to form so far Ocean Technologies. Our community, using our tools, have made important contributions to the understanding of species and ecosystems around the world and contributed to the education and engagement of thousands of students and young explorers. We only learned later, during a NOAA-organized meeting with leading ocean scientists and engineers, just how unique our effort had been. The scientists were less impressed with what we built, after all, they already had all of these tools, but in how we went about it by openly sharing our designs online, crowdfunding our initial startup costs, and most importantly, engaging a global community of citizen scientists. The experts were bound by constraints, both in economic and institutional, that we were not. Our innovation was not a result of genius, it was mostly luck, born of necessity, and amateur persistence. 
our inexperience mixed with a rapidly shifting technological landscape created an opportunity to move the needle on small, low-cost ROVs. I tell you this long story uh, for context, but also because I think we learned really important lessons, which I submit this committee could find useful. The first is to remember that the mission of ocean exploration to illuminate the unknown carries multiple meanings. It's widely reported, as everyone here has said, what little percentage of the ocean we've explored and characterized. Whether mapping the ocean floor or studying the varying depths of the water column, there are still vast areas of Earth left to explore, and we should. But there is another responsibility of the o ocean exploration enterprise that doesn't get as much attention, how we explore. Part of the process of discovery is the constant search for a better way and a new perspective. This is the technological frontier, and it's as dynamic and full of opportunity as the unexplored places. The emerging fields of robotics and machine learning, the advancements of eDNA and genetic sequencing, and the steady march of Moore's law and increasing connectivity continue to make this fertile ground for experimentation. We're still at the beginning of applying these technologies to the mission of understanding and monitoring the ocean. Over 10 years ago, NOAA made a leap by operationalizing Dr. Bob Ballard and the Ocean Exploration Trust's vision for telepresence and its potential to scale the effectiveness of a single ship at sea. And that telepresence has completely changed the way we conduct science, engage the public, and inspire the next generation. We need more leaps. Exploration is where we go and how we get there. The second lesson is that entrepreneurs and startups are an increasingly important part of navigating this technological frontier. Congress would be wise to look at the evolution of NASA over the past decade and hope for a similar ocean renaissance. As a generation of space entrepreneurs took to the cosmos, NASA was able to find commercially competitive contractors to take over launch and other duties, which allowed them to focus their resources on what they do best, going further. As NOAA faces the challenge of managing aging ships and infrastructure, the agency would do well to focus enough of their limited resources on stimulating a vibrant private sector rather than trying to rebuild everything themselves. The last lesson is we, we learned is that ocean exploration is for everyone. We all have a stake. This is not just a coastal, coastal issue. We were surprised by all of the enthusiasm we received for our project, the citizen scientists who wanted to get involved all over the world. I can do no better than John Steinbeck's Call to the Sea, published in 1966 in Popular Science, which is still as relevant as, as ever. There was something for everyone in the sea incredible beauty for the artist, the excitement and danger of exploration for the brave and restless, an open door for the ingenuity and inventiveness of the clever, a new world for the bored, food for the hungry, and incalculable material wealth for the acquisitive, and all of these in addition to the pure, clean wonder of increasing knowledge. Ocean exploration is a cause worth championing, and I hope that you do. Thank you, Mr. Lang. At this point, we'll begin our first round of questions, um, and I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes. I really enjoyed hearing from all of you, and there are some themes that emerge that all of you have talked about. One, stimulating um, excitement and innovation and interest in this exploration, and two, the partnerships. And so I want to try to touch on both of those, and I have general questions for the panel. Now, as I mentioned in my opening statement, and Dr. Weiner referenced, more people have walked on the moon than the than the uh, deepest parts of the ocean, and of course, being from Houston, we are very proud of our um, of our history of space exploration and putting man on the moon. But certainly, there's a lot of work to do here. So I um, I loved seeing the pictures of the artists um, that you had, Dr. Weiner, and I'm wondering if you all can suggest some specific ways that we can excite the public about ocean exploration. To your point, Mr. Lang, about invigorating a whole new group of folks to get out um, and engage in this process. Says, how can we excite um, the public about ocean exploration with the same figure that we've seen, for example, in space? And, and that's for anyone on the panel who wants to take it. I'm going to go first, Mr. Lang. I, w I would, yeah. I, I think it, when you think about what's happened with space and why it's received such a renewed um, excitement, the people who are leading that are entrepreneurs. It's Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Those are the first things that come to mind, and I think all of the other entrepreneurs who are following their lead. And so I think um, it's wise to, to look at that example um, of charismatic entrepreneurs as folks who can help reinvigorate. And I think NASA has done a great job of working with that momentum and helping to support it. Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in? Dr. Weiner? 
I'd like to weigh in as well, thank you. Um, another point I'd like to make too, um, in terms of the space-ocean comparison, uh, space has done a really good job of branding itself, and the oceans have uh, are getting there, but it, it's a lot more uh, diverse. We've got coral reefs and shallow waters and deep sea and um, many different ecosystems, and making those um, connections, I think, is something that needs to be emphasized more, and also uh, reaching those that haven't traditionally been involved in the ocean. So um, reaching some of our underserved or underrepresented groups that don't have direct access to the ocean and starting um, with inspiration at a young age and following through from K to gray, making sure that we are able to engage um, all of our public communities in the ocean. Thank you, Dr. Reiner. Dr. Bell? Yeah, I'd like to go in a slightly different direction and look at uh, media and entertainment. Um, I have no idea what percentage, but I would be willing to bet that a large percentage of people who are in the space industry loved watching Star Trek um, and Star Wars. And there are many people, May Jameson, for example, who cites her experience at NASA because of Nichelle Nichols in, in Star Trek. Um, and I think that it would be a, a huge opportunity lost to not look at media and entertainment because of the stories that can be imagined and told about potentially utopian ocean futures rather than the dystopian ones that we see every day in the media um, to bring it to a much, much larger audience than today we're able to through. And we are reaching tens of millions with telepresence. We are reaching lots and lots of people through citizen science initiatives. But if we actually want to reach billions of people, I think we need to do it um, with different types of partnerships than we have before. Thank you. Uh, well, that, that touches on sort of the second area that I wanted to go to, and knowing that I have limited time, maybe I can just segue over to talk a little bit about the existing partnerships and how we can strengthen the existing partnerships amongst government, academia, industry that you all have, have referenced. How can we strengthen those to leverage the available ocean exploration tools? I think, Mr. Barrett, you talked a little bit about that um, and resources in the future. And then how can we kind of broaden that to, to reach your objective, Dr. Bell, of, of widening um, interest? Maybe, Mr. Barrett, could you talk about that a little bit more? You bet. I think, um, I think one of the challenges for industry and commercial enterprises like oceaneering is investment and investment in new technology. It comes with inherent risk. And often we invest in new technologies because we have a clear line of sight to our customers' needs and how we would commercialize towards those needs. I think a better line of sight to a broader spectrum of technological needs that, um, that uh, apply to ocean exploration in, in the academic sense and in the scientific sense and what the vision go forward for that is that could be very useful to commercial enterprise to shape better how they um, view and justify technical uh, investments, technology investments. I think the other piece that um, it seems to me that uh, the collaboration around the vast numbers of ocean-going vessels and how they could be utilized to um, capture more data on a regular basis is something that should be explored more fully. It'll take a platform and forums and better better opportunities to engage with those enterprises to do it, but it, it seems like an opportunity to me. Thank you, Mr. Barrett, and I see that I have gone over my allotted time, so I will now recognize Ranking Member Marshall for five minutes. Okay, thank you, Chairwoman. I want to talk about a little bit about globally, some of the global challenges that we have. In, in particular, um, I'm always interested to know if our scientists are talking to scientists from other countries, spe specifically China, India, Russia, Japan, Brazil. Is there any interaction between what we're doing and some folks from there? With, if any of the four of you had interaction with scientists from other groups working on solving this problem that we have together? This is a world challenge, obviously. Dr. Bell does. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, working with Nautilus for, for many years, we worked in all over the Mediterranean region, and so therefore working with um, scientists from all of those countries. Um, and one really exciting opportunity coming up is the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which um, is sort of being, ideas are coming together right now to launch for 2021 to 2030, and I think that's a huge opportunity to work with like-minded scientists from all over the world. Um, Will China and Russia participate in that? Um, I believe that there were scientists, there were scientists from China at the first global planning meeting that was just held two weeks ago in Denmark. I 
don't know if Russia was represented there, um, but the that was just the first planning meeting, and regional meetings are being planned for the next year. So India, that, Brazil, would, the, would they most likely be there? Um, I would have to check. Is there anything that we can do to promote those relationships and work on this challenge together? Absolutely. There are several members of the, um, the executive planning group for the UN decade that are from the US, Craig McLean, um, most notably who's the acting chief scientist of NOAA. Um, so I would definitely talk to him first about who from those countries have been represented so far and who might um, be in the future. There will be several regional planning meetings coming up in the next year, and I believe that Brazil might be one of the hosts of those. Um, but I'd be happy to get back to you. Okay. Anybody else with the interaction with other scientists, Mr. Barrett? Uh, no, ours really is through, we're a global company, but our interaction is always through our customers traditionally in the global f stage. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just so, wanted to add um, to the remarks from Dr. Bell that there's also the Seabed 2030 project, which is an initiative um, from the Nippon Foundation in Japan. Um, and it's a global initiative to try and map the entire ocean seafloor by 2030. And so that's other an, uh, another opportunity to engage and collaborate with the nations that you've mentioned. Um, Schmidt Ocean in Institute also um, looks to uh, international collaborations, and we have hosted many scientists from multiple countries um, collaboratively on our research vessel for different projects, uh, including some of the um, countries that you had mentioned. Okay, so certainly my learning curve on oceanography right now is, is like this, and I'm, I'm back here, so forgive me if this is a, uh, an ignorant question, but as I think about the function of the ocean, removing carbon gases and then restoring oxygen from all the plankton and, and that we have around the, around the world, is that all done in the top 10 or 20 meters of water, or is there, other, is there plants down lower that are doing that as well in your research? So the actual um, photosynthesis that's happening is being done in, in the top layers where sunlight can, can penetrate through the water. Um, but the ocean circulates on a global level from sea surface down to deep waters. So it's a very interconnected system. Um, I am not an expert in that particular field, but um, well, the, the carbon dioxide that's being used by plants is happening in, in the top layers. So are there any innovation opportunities down deeper to help promote that photosynthesis that's going on above? And I think that's what you're starting to go in that direction a little bit. Do you want, I, I have one interesting fact about whales. Um, <laughs> that um, whale defecation actually is a huge um, input of carbon to those systems to support plankton, which then are the basis of, for example, fisheries and, and other, um, it's, a, it's a very I hope they're not releasing any methane system. gas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Finer, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add to that, um, that we still don't fully understand those relationships, and that is why exploration and research is so important, is to, to better characterize these um, very specific exam, um, not, uh, sorry, to better characterize how these interactions take place and looking at these um, um, small ecosystem relationships and how they are interconnected. Okay. Anybody else? I, I would add uh, it's, uh, the perspective of someone who's also relatively new to the ocean exploration uh, enterprise and ocean science. And the thing that was most surprising to me over the past five decade has been realizing just how little we know and how much we're actually at the beginning of starting to understand these kind of systems and how much progress can So I'm gonna, I need to yield back, but I think we, we keep the goal in mind if our goal is to uh, innovate uh, as opposed to just researching for researching. So I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. And uh, before we move on, I would also like to mention that we received two letters of support for this hearing um, and ocean exploration from OceanX and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution that I will submit for the record. Um, and with that, I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Lamb for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Lang, I was very interested in what you said about as NOAA makes decisions going forward about the use of its resources. Um, sort of where we direct those investments and how they can take advantage of the energy of uh, young entrepreneurs and folks in the private sector while also kind of doing the core mission that you um, benefit from. Because you highlighted 
telepresence in your testimony, and um, that was sort of a NOAA-led innovation, as I understand it. So could you maybe just go in a little more detail about, in your experience, what you saw as the strengths of NOAA, like the things that only NOAA could have done, um, and the things that you think could be uh, sort of more efficiently built upon by people in your situation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think the the biggest thing that the biggest opportunity is in terms of autonomy and distributed systems. Um, I think the costs of sensors and compute is going down. Connectivity is continuing to increase. I know SpaceX just launched their Starlink system. Um, connectivity is going to change dramatically in the next few years. And the way that we do, um, the way that we actually collect that data could be done in a much more distributed manner. And, and you, there's a number of startups working in this area. And it's, it's a really uh, tricky interface right now to work with NOAA. It's a, it's, there's a lot of hurdles and a lot, a lot of, it's unclear what, what the interface actually is. And I think that's the, the big opportunity is to create are those directives. Are those technical hurdles? Like they don't have the systems to, to make the data interact with each other? Or is it more regulatory or cultural? Or could you, I, I would say it's uh, cultural. I think okay. the way that, how, how fast a startup moves, you yeah. think about the way that we're able to raise capital um, and the timelines that we're working on in like months and years rather than uh, the way that kind of the NOAA grant process works is more on an academic um, schedule, which is actually really a tough way to work for um, uh, smaller companies like ours. It's, it's easier for bigger companies who have those kinds, of, those kinds of cycles, but it's trickier for a group like ours. I think the, yeah, the Department of Defense with their DIU has kind of has started to make headway into trying to figure out a way to interface with these, with these companies, but um, it's still, it's still a, a problem worth solving. Okay, um, and the the advancements in in your space. Can you just kind of describe what you expect to see in the next few years as far as these, um, you know, the, just these underwater drones, for lack of a better term? Uh, I mean, are we talking sort of pure data gathering? Are we talking like actual exploration of you know species and? testing to determine if we could get, you know, anti-inflammatory drugs or anything out of them. Could tell me just kind of how, where we are. Yeah, so um, these are our ROVs right here. I mean, this is orders of magnitude smaller and cheaper than what's existed before. Um, I think we're gonna continue to see the miniaturization um, and the autonomous potential. I think there's a ton happening with uh, positioning sensors that's gonna open up a lot. The, the way that eDNA has become a way to actually sense what's in the environment, um, I think you look at how cheap genetic sequencing is getting, um, that we're going to have a, a, an opportunity to characterize these environments in a, in a completely uh, revolutionary way. So you think we're, we're not that far away from the ability, for example, for one of your sensors to actually sequence a, a genome underwater and send that data back to the surface? I don't know if uh, one of our, the in situ um, genetic sequencing is um, not something, I don't know how close we are to that exactly, because you got to understand everything, th as fast as that's moving on land, we're doing that in situ underwater is really hard. Right. right. But I, I would say when you look at like from a systems perspective and the way that we've in, been able to engage this global community of citizen scientists, there's a huge opportunity to um, engage people in a different way. And there was just, a, the in 2016, the Citizen Science um, Act, I forget the precise name of it, um, but allowed that data be, to be used for um, scientific research purposes and for government research purposes. So there, there is kind of some precedent to start thinking about these systems in new ways, these data collection systems. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamb. I will now recognize Mr. Babin for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, witnesses, for being here. We really appreciate your testimony. Uh, in addition to serving on this subcommittee, I also serve as a ranking member on Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, and I have the privilege of representing Johnson Space Center uh, back home in Houston. Uh, and with that in mind, I'd like to ask a couple of questions about ocean exploration and how this field is often closely tied uh, with technologies that are used in space exploration as well. And so, Mr. Baird, I'll start with you. Oceaneering has engaged in extensive research and development as part of its core business of energy exploration. 
and for many years, Oceaneering has uh, been involved in the space industry and is currently working with NASA on the next generation spacesuit. How did your work in ocean exploration contribute to the spacesuit development, and what lessons learned from that ocean exploration have helped you in spacesuit development as, as, as well? Congressman Babin, that's a great question. It's, it's a, such a natural adjacency to take technology and methods that were developed in a harsh environment underwater and then uh, use those in a harsh environment that includes the vacuum of space. And so the way that um, man interacts with that, env uh, that environment uh, through whether it's a space suit or through a diving suit, there are tremendous learnings and applications that, that were deployed. Um, we mostly do work underwater in our, in our diving and in our ROV business. And the way you do work through automation, through tool position, through the use and design of the tools, as well as the visibility and the inherent uh, challenges of, of mobility and dexterity, it's, it's a, a natural adjacency for us. And it even carries into um, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, which we operate the divers for the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. So to simulate working in space, it's a natural to do that underwater and make the astronaut neutrally buoyant so he can practice his, I think they call it EVAs, his extra right. vehicle activity over and over until it's uh, very routine and very, uh, very precise. So, Which is more hostile, underwater or space? Well, in some ways underwater. Uh, when I first I joined the subsea business and we, we uh, were completing, uh, helping our customers complete wells in 10,000 feet of water, the difference is, uh, you know, a vacuum has a pressure differential of one atmosphere. In 10,000 feet of water, you've got pressures of 5,000 psi. So, in some ways, the ocean depths uh, can be, I will say, as hostile or more hostile. Right. Uh, that does not surprise me. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Weiner, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I serve as a ranking member of Space and Aeronautics. As I said, I was fascinated to read how the Schmidt Institute had worked with NASA on the development and testing of hardware in preparation of future deep space missions by utilize, uh, utilizing the depths of the ocean, kind of similar to the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. How is this partnership between NASA and the institution initiated? And following up on that, uh, what have been the benefits for each side in this partnership? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, we've been working with scientists in the research community who work with NASA on development of technologies. Um, there are similar goals there between ocean exploration and space exploration. Um, an example is the Abyss Lander. Um, this was recently used on research vessel Falkor in 2018 um, with Dr. Peter Gerges from Harvard. And some of the technologies that they were using on this lander are to test and see how things work on this lander that could also be used in space. Additionally, um, other technologies have been looked at with other scientists on Falkor in terms of um, remote capabilities and being able to talk to uh, the technologies or the robotics that you're using um, and, and using AI to make um, decisions when they're away from, let's say, the mothership, uh, whether that's a vessel or a spaceship. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Babin. Um, and as you all can hear from the bells, uh, votes have just been called, as I mentioned at the beginning of our hearing. So we're going to stand in recess for probably about 15 minutes. I, I believe we just have one vote um, on the floor. Um, but we're going to recess, and then we'll come back. Um, thank you.
The hearing will come to order. We are now reconvening our hearing. Thank you to the witnesses for your patience. Um, and we were in the process of taking questions from committee members. So I believe at this time, I will now recognize Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And thank you for holding this hearing in honor of World Oceans Week. Our oceans hold so much promise from understanding the origins of life to offering new medicines uh, to the enhancing of opportunities to learn and excite new students, and of course, providing for the thrill of exploration and innovation. The evidence undeniably shows that climate change is hurting our oceans, and the trend will only get worse with inaction. As a committee, the promise of our oceans should motivate us to push forward in addressing the challenges of climate change. In 1962, President Kennedy gave his famous moonshot speech in support of the Apollo program. In less than 10 years, NASA landed a person on the moon, proving that incredible achievements in science and technology can come about in a relatively short amount of time. So for each and every one of our witnesses, is there a need for an ocean exploration moonshot? And if so, what should it aim to achieve? Maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Bell. That's an excellent question. I think that absolutely, yes, there should be an ocean moonshot. Um, what exactly it should be, I think, should be um, a broader discussion. Um, but looking at exploring some percentage of the ocean by 2030, 2040 um, would be ambitious, but yet feasible. Um, what that percentage is, maybe 30%, I don't know. Hmm. Um, but I think that it's definitely something that would galvanize um, the United States behind a common goal, the scientific community, the um, private community, federal, philanthropic, um, and would provide some sort of end, end goal that we can accomplish together. Thank you. Dr. Wiener? Uh, yes, I echo uh, Katie's comments that I do think a ocean shot or moon shot would be uh, a very helpful and important initiative. Um, having a common goal, whether it's uh, mapping the seafloor or uh, working together to really focus in efforts on um, working on technology advancement to be able to characterize the ocean in a more persistent and um, low cost way, I think would be another way that we could really help make dramatic improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barrett. Yeah, um, just, just building a little bit, we talked a little earlier about inspiring the best, brightest minds, the entrepreneurs, the, the students to enter the field. And I think, uh, I think a, a moonshot, quote unquote, uh, a very tangible, exciting goal that could spur more collaboration, get people really excited. Uh, I do believe that it's uh, no one sector or government alone or industry, or I think, I think it has to be the kind of goal that people could really wrap around across all the sectors. Uh, I think it'd be fantastic. Thank you. And Mr. Lang? Um, I think the, the moonshot works really well in space, and I think I, I like Elon's goal of going to Mars as being an invigorating uh, motivator for space. When I think about oceans, I think uh, of Jacques Cousteau and the example that he set. And to me, the biggest challenge facing our oceans is not plastic pollution or ocean acidification. It's getting more people to care. And I think the biggest challenge is that. And in order to do that, I, I look to Cousteau really as the, as the model we should try and emulate. And he's known for obviously his media, as Katie said, is an important part of this. But he also co-invented the aqualung. He invented scuba diving. And I think we need to think about these kind of new technologies that give everyone the ability to actually participate in this whole process. And I think uh, NOAA, in particular, has an incredible opportunity to lead that engagement process. Wonderful. And, and with that field of ocean exploration, um, how is it evolving with the development of new technologies? Anyone? I, uh, I highlighted a few, but I think with the work that um, Mr. Lang is doing, I think it's going to evolve around how do we get more, um, you know, more devices, collecting data, mapping. It's going to be about power management. There's going to be new technologies needed for communications and autonomy to deploy these um, assets, sensors, subsea for extended period of time, it's gonna take some new technology to be able to deliver the power probably from the surface or recharging, these types of things. 
And um, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And I think the connectivity is a big enabler for everybody uh, as, we, as we get more communication power distributed across the oceans. And Dr. Bell? Yeah, um, and another thing that we need to consider is also the, um, the scale on which we do it. Um, so this, you, everybody has a supercomputer in their pocket now because millions of these devices are made. There's more computing power in this than all the computers combined that put men on the moon. Um, so if we actually want to explore the entire ocean or some significant part of it, we need to dramatically bring down the cost of systems, sensors, and the data um, analysis. People can't sit there after an expedition and review every second of every bit of video that has been collected. We need to be using advanced... Um, algorithms, machine learning, computer vision to be able to deal with the amount of information that will be coming in. Thank you. My time has expired, but uh, I just want to share with Mr. Lang that uh, earlier you mentioned the Citizen Scientist Act. I'm very proud to have sponsored that legislation and uh, even more proud that it's been recently signed into law. So thank you and uh, let's go forward with science. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. I'll now recognize Mr. Gonzalez for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for your patience and uh, attention today. Um, turning first to, to Dr. Bell, in your written testimony, you mentioned ocean science compared to other fields of science has been largely left behind by the digital era. Uh, help me understand that a little bit. How much of that is sort of the, the scope of the problem or the scope of the, the research that we're trying to do itself versus workforce um, versus just general interest? Kind of just flesh that out for me a little bit. Um, so one of the challenges, again, is just the fact that the tools that we're using today are so um, large and custom built. Everybody redesigns a pressure housing for every different vehicle that is being created. Um, and so if we're able to take advantage of, for example, you know, cell phone revolution, the fact that everybody has a computer bringing down the costs of chips and all of the other devices that are required to do that, um, then we can bring down the costs, and significantly increase the amount of area or volume that we can explore for the same amount of money eventually. So why are they custom built? Because I mean, that's the like, right, the, the custom built on-premise software versus cloud-based solution question applied to this problem. Why, sure, I why might defer to, to Mr. Barrett on that one for engineering. Yeah. The, you know, the marine environment is, is an extra harsh environment. Um, things that come in and out of the water are, are subjected to every aspect of corrosion. And so you end up with inherent costs associated with equipment and deployment of that equipment in the, in the offshore environment. And, and truly the scale, back to the scale, uh, you know, problem or opportunity, depending on how we do it, um, the only way to get the cost down is really through scale, through having a volume of, of equipment or sensors or even the, a volume of ability to deploy them is going to be the only way, I think, to get the cost down associated with massive ocean exploration. Okay. Um, and then uh, turning a little bit to um, workforce. So, Mr. Barrett, you represent a company who's benefited from ocean exploration and research. Uh, what can this committee do to help you continue uh, technology development efforts, and how challenging is it to find a well-trained workforce in this field? I think, uh, I think our company is pretty well positioned to find the workforce, uh, but I do believe that um, this committee could you know, further support STEM education, particularly as it relates to ocean and ocean sciences. We, uh, I think, uh, previously highlighted the, the need to get more people engaged, more entrepreneurs engaged, more public awareness um, so that it is an exciting field to go into. I think we have to create um, an infrastructure that provides opportunities, uh, more opportunities, and that comes through companies like ours that provides opportunities because we're commercially successful. It comes from academia, it comes from nonprofits having the funding to be able to provide exciting opportunities, and it comes from the success of uh, entrepreneurs. So I think anything you can do to support those endeavors. And uh, finally, I would say the collaboration piece again. Uh, a platform's more, uh, you know, an easier path to collaborate is another area that I think could help us as a company see the vision and future better so that it de-risks our techno technological investments a little bit. Great. And then uh, Dr. Bell, 
Uh, you cite research that suggests the number of students pursuing PhDs in ocean engineering have remained steady while other fields, such as aerospace engineering, have increased. Uh, to what do you attribute that trend, and, and what are you uh, doing to address this challenge? Um, that's an excellent question. I don't know why that's happening. Um, what am I doing to address it? Well, being involved in STEM education um, and sort of broad public engagement in general is definitely one thing I'm doing. Uh, last year, about six months ago, I chaired the 2018 Ocean Exploration, National Ocean Exploration Forum at MIT, which was on broadening engagement and participation. Great, and I didn't mean it to be a personal question, sorry. Um, no, no, no. Maybe, maybe let me ask it differently. Um, what, what in addition should we be doing? What should societal maybe take that lens on it? Sure. Um, well, I think there. that looking at um, different partners and different industries in a, in a different and creative way than we've done it in the past, rolling out yet another ocean curriculum for a middle school is not nearly as exciting and engaging as maybe a television show or a movie um, that highlights factual things, but also may have, you know, exciting storytelling behind it. Aquaman, for example, was the highest grossing DC comic movie um, of all time, over a billion dollars brought in the box office. So, like, there's an appetite for the ocean themes, I think. Yeah. Great. Well, with the Aquaman reference, I yield back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I will now recognize Mr. Kasten for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Fletcher. Thank you to the panel. I have, must apologize. I have not seen Aquaman yet. Uh, <laughs> um, I was really hoping there was a nice pivot there. Um, the I I want to talk a little bit about um, climate change. Um, we had a at our full committee hearing yesterday. One of the witnesses described how ninety percent of all of the 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 heat that we have generated because of of man made CO two emissions has been absorbed by the oceans. Good news is it's a lot cooler up here on the land than it was than it would otherwise be. The bad news is that we have that heat absorbed in the part of the Earth that we seem to least understand. And <clears throat> um, I, I want to start with Dr. Bell. How much do we understand about how that heat stratifies at, at deeper depths, and where 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 are there gaps in our knowledge that you think we should focus on on really pushing to understand that that stratification of temperature in the ocean? So I'm not an expert, admittedly, in, in climate change and heat distribution. Um, but my understanding, and I'd like to echo Dr. Weiner's comments earlier, is that we really, truly don't have a good um, understanding of ocean systems. We have a pretty high level understanding, but looking at specific locations, for example, um, during the break, I was speaking with Mr. Barrett about um, oxygen concentrations and how they affect their subsea equipment, but they didn't know that um, while deploying different types of equipment. So we have good, generally good global models, but verifying them with in situ measurements all over the world um, is something that we really don't have and don't have a really um, fine-grained understanding of, of how that works yet. Would, would any of you care to comment on what where th the gaps in our knowledge and where we should be thinking about from a science committee to fill in those gaps right now? Uh, I also am not an expert on the subject, but just from working <coughs> with many of the scientists who have come on FALCOR to look at this very question, I would say it's not just a matter of looking at uh, heat distribution, but also uh, pH and oxygen levels and how those are impacted by temperature changes. The other piece of it that has um, captured a lot of interest from scientists coming on to FALCOR is um, other gases like methane that is stored um, in the seafloor and how that methane is transformed in the water and eventually makes its way to the atmosphere. And that's something else that's been looked at and would have an impact in um, climate change. So, so you read my mind on my next question. Uh, Mr. Barrett, I think you talked about doing some, doing some work with some of your clients on, on uh, offshore gas development. I'm assuming that was methane hydrates you were referring to? Well, uh, no, we haven't, we haven't been directly involved in mining methane hydrates. No, I was talking about the more traditional aspects okay. of oil and gas production. Okay. We have, well, uh, I, I think we've done some uh, survey work around methane hydrates, but that's not part of our direct 
business. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, well, I guess I'd follow up with Dr. Dr. Um, Weiner. As we, as we raise these temperatures, there's a ton of these clathrates that are down, down at depth that we are, I think, all crossing our fingers that are going to stay at depth um, given, the, given the impact on climate. And, and it comes back to my question, as we warm up at these deeper levels, <clears throat> and I'm, I, I should understand the thermodynamics better, is it, is it pressure that keeps them down there? Is it temperature that keeps them down there? Or is it both? Because the pressure will presumably stay. But as the temperature goes up, how concerned should we be? You know, I, I don't feel like I have the expertise to really answer um, the depth of, of um, concern that we should have. Uh, I certainly do think, though, that making sure we have a fundamental understanding of that through baseline studies um, is critical to, to before we progress with anything uh, further. Okay. And, I, can, I can comment a little bit on it. There's a, um, you know, methane hydrate formation curve that has to do with both temperature and pressure. So at points on that pressure temperature combination is where hydrates form. So it's a combination of the two. Um, our company is involved in hydrates that actually form in pipelines, subsea, and the remediation of those. But but not uh, again not with those naturally occurring hydrates that are you know found on the ocean bottom. So so with your familiarity on that pressure temperature curve, the as I said the you know the the pressure at ten twelve atmospheres is going to stay ten twelve atmospheres of pressure, but the temperature is going to change. Are there are there ranges of possible warming that get up to a concerning point where it shifts into the gas phase? Yes, I mean, there, there are two ways to bust a hydrate. There's one to increase the temperature or to reduce the pressure. Yeah. That's the extent of my knowledge right okay. there. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you all for letting me geek out for a second um, and I, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Kasten. I'll now recognize Mr. Beyer for five minutes. That, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all very much for being here. Um, <clears throat> the ocean-space dichotomy is fascinating because this is a panel that loves space. Uh, so we get, thank you for giving us a chance to learn so much more about the deep ocean. One of the, um, Mr. Lang, in, in some of the printed testimony, we had the, it'll take 10,000 ship years to completely view the seafloor. Um, and even if we have a full-time exploration rate of, of 10 ships, it'll take 1,000 years. That's longer than we probably want it to take. You've suggested that maybe NOAA should scale back on this direct investment in ships and infrastructure and let the private sector take up the slack. And we've certainly watched for years as NOAA has been pushing for um, ever more congressional investment in its, its fleet. Can you comment on how likely it is that the private sector will pick up this what is now a 10,000 year project? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I th you know, in my involvement on the, the NOAA Ocean Exploration Advisory Board, um, I've been involved in some of those conversations and heard, you know, everyone's aware of the, of the challenge. I think the reality is that if we want to map the, the ocean floor to the extent we want to, it's going to take distributed autonomous systems. And the good news is, is these things are getting cheaper and they're getting smaller and they're getting more affordable. I think the, the question is, can we get enough brain power and enough people working on innovating in this field and in that space? And I think the, there has to be more of an economic incentive, a clear economic incentive to drive the investment, to drive the enthusiasm of, of entrepreneurs and technologists. Which means to say, if you map it all, what economic value is it to entrepreneurs or the public? Yes, b both, right? There has to be kind of economic mechanisms to underwrite that development, whether that's um, mapping. Uh, but also, there, there does have to be a, a driver that, um, that spurs it. And I, you know, whether that's uh, deep sea mining, um, I'm not sure. Okay, great, thank you. Dr. Bell, you... Um, talked about how the six leading autonomous underwater vehicle companies, uh, only half are the U.S., um, but obviously the U.S. has been the leader in all of this ocean research. Where's China? Which also comes up in this committee a lot. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes this morning. Um, 
That I don't know. Most of the autonomous vehicle companies that I know of are more in Western countries than in China. Um, I do know that there has been a sudden explosion of small ROVs by Chinese companies just like in the last six months to a year. Um, they is, is there any reason we need to be threatened by Chinese research? As we are, for example, with Chinese research in AI. I don't know enough to answer that question. Okay. Cool. Well, um, yeah, Mr. Lang. Uh, I think we, we can look at what happened with aerial drones. Um, these, these got smaller and cheaper. And what we keep talking about are making, getting to economies of scale and making sure the sensors and the production can build these at the scales that we need. And uh, that's something they're very good at and something that we're not as good at. And it, it's, we are the, at, on the front lines of that competition. And I think if you look at aerial drones, you can see how we kind of lost out on that industry um, because of our inability to engage with um, smaller entrepreneurs who are just getting going at the same time. Great. Thank you. I don't know who to address this question to, but the, the whole discovery of the chemosynthetic bacteria in the deep vents um, I guess something that clearly didn't need light um, to have life, and I don't know how much oxygen is involved in it, is uh, what will this help us to understand in terms of the origins of life? The, there's a recent book that I just read a review of this morning that talked about we probably are the only intelligent life in the universe because it's so difficult for life to evolve, and yet here have we had life evolve twice, once in the photosynthetic way and once in the chemosynthetic way? No molecular biologists or geneticists on our panel. Are <laughs> All right, let me well, add. I don't know if they evolve separately or or not, but um, there are many ocean scientists who are interested in the origins of life, um, and are also looking to other ocean worlds. Um, so they're studying um, the microbiome here on Earth, so that they can start to identify what types <laughs> of things we might find, for example, on Europa, um, once we're able to drill through the ice and get down through the water. So. Um, using the information that we're able to study and understand here on Earth is definitely being used for understanding the sort of broader uh, question of life in the universe. Okay, great, thank you. And then an easy question. The, the Ocean Exploration Act of 2009 required NOAA to establish a national strategy and program for, for ocean exploration. Is there such an actual national strategy now that's formalized, that's one paragraph, one sentence, one book? I was looking for it all through the testimony, and I saw a lot of amazing ideas, but no national strategy per the act. Okay. Well, I don't know if there is one. There was a review, a 10-year review of the, um, of the office and a report as a result of that. Um, has the OEAB been a part of a, a national strategy? That's absolutely a discussion that happens at the, the OEAB uh, level is trying to set that priority, um, and I, there there's an annual a se annual or semi annual uh, conference that happens where they bring people from uh, all sorts of sectors that we do discuss that. I the question that you asked is a good one. Is there a paragraph that describes it? And I think that's something that because none of us can recall it is if it exists, it's not yeah. um, well well known enough. Well, I know the chairman of the subcommittee, so I'm going to talk to her about it, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Byer. I'd now like to recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Uh, thank you all for being here. I, I just want to start with a follow-up to Representative Gonzalez's question about workforce, especially because, Dr. Bell, I saw that you uh, do your work at the MIT Media Lab. and. Uh, more than five years ago, John Maeda, who spent 12 years at the MIT Media Lab, who was at the time the president of the Rhode Island School of Design, came here to Capitol Hill to help me launch the bipartisan STEAM caucus, which integrates arts and design into to traditional STEM learning to help, number one, engage uh, more people, especially uh, diversify the, the workforce at the, the um, K-12 level and college level, um, but also to make sure that people who are entering this, this STEM 
STEM fields are uh, getting both halves of their brain educated so we have cre creativity and innovation in the STEM workforce. So I just wanted to, to mention that there is a, a bipartisan congressional STEAM caucus. I also serve on the education committee and it comes up as well uh, when we're looking at expanding that workforce. The schools that uh, have taken the, uh, the STEAM approach are seeing more engagement um, and uh, more creativity and, and innovation. So uh, uh, now starting with, you know, looking, looking at our planet and Ms. Uh, Representative Byer mentioned, you know, the, the, the focus on space in this committee. If you look down from space at the planet, you, you see blue, fundamentally blue, um, because the oceans cover more than 70% of our planet's surface. And, and you look at, I mean, this is Oceans Month and uh, Oceans Week here on Capitol Hill. When you look at uh, the, the blue economy and the importance of the oceans for feeding people and the power of the ocean waves and uh, the potential for generating clean energy and so much is dependent uh, on ocean. Uh, Representative Kasten mentioned you know, that uh, absorbing the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, there's so much happening. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating that we still know very little about what's deep in the ocean compared with what we know about the surface. So. As we're preparing for the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development uh, and the top priority to map the ocean floor, I'm working with my uh, fellow co-chair of the House, o House Oceans Caucus, Representative Don Young from Alaska, to highlight the importance of improving our ocean data and monitoring efforts. So uh, later this month, I'm going to be introducing the House Companion to Senator Whitehouse's Bolstering Long-Term Understanding and Exploration of the Great Lakes, Oceans, Bays, and Estuaries. It's easier to remember Blue Globe Act. Um, and that would rap rapidly accelerate the collection, management, and dissemination of data on the Great Lakes, oceans, bays, estuaries, and coasts. It also tasks the National Academy of Sciences with assessing the potential for an advanced research project agency or, uh, on oceans, or basically an ARPA-O, uh, because we need to overcome the long-term and high-risk barriers in the development of ocean technology. So Dr. Bell, in your testimony, you talk about a data analysis bottleneck. So what are the greatest challenges today in the collection management and dissemination of ocean data? Sure. Well, one of one of the biggest challenges is just the fact that it's so distributed. Everybody has NOAA has its data, Schmidt has its data, the Ocean Exploration Trust has its data. Everybody has it in distributed ways, um, and even if. T they say it's publicly accessible and available. In some cases, it can be extremely difficult to get. So just even finding, and that's for somebody who knows where to look and oh, okay. knows people in those organizations, right? So if anybody doesn't know that or would just be curious, probably couldn't get the data. Um, another one is that we're sort of on the verge right now of truly big ocean data um, in comparison to organizations like Google or other tech companies which are dealing with very, very large amounts of data. Ocean data really isn't quite big yet, but if we're talking about deploying thousands or millions of different types of sensors all over the world, we're really going to have to figure out how do we actually deal with that data. We're not going to be able to have somebody physically sitting there looking at every second of video, right? So we need right, to develop right. the kinds of algorithms to create um, automated um, analysis so that we can pull out that information and understanding so that we can um, really understand what we're collecting. Because if we start collecting terabytes, petabytes, whatever the correct... <laughs> <laughs> Pref prefixes, right, right. Um, we're not going to be able to do it. So I wanted to be useful. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I want to move on. Uh, last Congress, I helped secure funding for the construction of a National Science Foundation regional class vessel. It's going to be operated by Oregon State University. It's called the um, TANI. It comes from the Solette's term, meaning offshore, scheduled for delivery um, in 2021. And it's going to be equipped to conduct some detailed seafloor mapping. Uh, the TANI is going to help identify um, geologic structures important in the Cascadia subdu subduction zone earthquakes that could likely tr trigger a significant tsunami on the Pacific coast. So, Dr. Weiner, why are the scientific what why are the scientific what a, what and why are the scientific benefits of mapping the ocean floor important? And what breakthroughs do you um, believe will emerge as we expand the seafloor mapping? Uh, well, it is critically important that we are able to map our seafloor, not only to just understand what's down there, but to um, better characterize the different environments and how they connect to each other. Um, there are many, multiple initiatives, as we mentioned earlier today, that are looking to um, collaborate and bring together all of this mapping data. Um, there are different 
scales of mapping data, whether it's centimeter sub-resolution scale, which you get from a robotic vehicle versus multi-beam mapping, which is a, a larger, it's still high resolution, but not in the same uh, focus. And I think both are important to have um, for our ecosystems. I'd also like to uh, mention that it's wonderful to hear about the STEAM initiative that you're doing. And um, our Artist at Sea program works with some of the data that's collected to tr transform it in an artistic way um, for the public. We actually have an exhibit opening this weekend in Detroit. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. I see my time is, oh, Dr. May, Bell. May. Can we let Dr. Bell respond? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Chair. Um, just a specific example for importance of seafloor mapping, especially for tsunamis, um, is that you need to know the shape of the seafloor for tsunami models to be accurate, to know how much and the, the um, sort of magnitude of run-up will be on coast. So that is particularly important for um, tsunami modeling and, right. and warning. Which is critical because we're, mm -hmm. we're overdue for a massive earthquake out there. Absolutely. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. And before we bring the hearing to a close, I thought I would just see if I could give each witness about 30 seconds to share with us, if you would like to, what you think Congress could do to support ocean exploration. And maybe we'll start with Dr. Bell and just run down the line. Sure. I have three things that Congress could do to support ocean exploration. The first is to reauthorize the No Office of Ocean Exploration Research because that uh, the Public Law 111-11 expired in 2015. Um, the second would be to create a national or international program um, to include private, public, academic, and philanthropic partnerships, and not it being solely a, a federal agency, but rather a more inclusive one, um, and also to uh, support sufficient funding for said programs because in the last 20 years, it's been pretty unstable and insufficient to really make true um, headway on accelerating and transforming the future of exploration. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Weiner, do you have anything to add? Uh, I also have three recommendations that um, somewhat echo Katie's um, Katie's response, but uh, leveraging economies of scale to decrease the cost of sensors and systems to make them available to more people, to cover more ocean, and to build capacity in technology-poor regions, uh, protecting sea resources where they are vulnerable. We should also look to the advances of other industries, making exciting innovations across technology sectors, such as the medical, oil, and gas defense, et cetera, um, industries that could be applied to ocean research and to position ocean exploration for high-risk, high-reward, conservation-minded ocean science. Thank you, Dr. Weiner. Mr. Barrett? Well, I think they covered it really well. <clears throat> I do believe cost is going to be the area that we really need to focus on and figuring out ways to leverage what uh, either already exists or how we build scale into the whole effort because individual missions are just extremely cost, uh, costly and it, you know you can't cover 70% of the earth very well that way. Um, I think I already highlighted the other two, which is certainly the uh, educational aspect, getting the best and brightest engaged and excited about this field I think is, is critical. And, uh, and finally, I think the way, you know, way we could collaborate better, and I think a, a, a good place for Congress would be to create a vision and to create some goals and to create some consensus around where we want to be as a country and, uh, and for the world in terms of understanding the ocean better. I think those types of visionary, um, you know, from the top, those visionary statements and, and leadership is really what it takes to, I think, muster the whole effort. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. And Mr. Lang. Yeah, I, I agree with, with all the recommendations listed, including uh, the reauthorization. Um, I, the only thing I would add is that to remember that ocean exploration is not just where we go, but how we get there. And this, this endeavor, this National Ocean Exploration Initiative has a real opportunity to pioneer some new strategies. Um, in how we go about getting there. And I think, you know, given what space has done, it seems to me that engaging with, with private companies and um, with entrepreneurs and, and supporting those visions is a, is a really good way to do it. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam thank Chair, <coughs> yes. may I throw out a 15 second challenge? You sure please? can. Uh, I, I would like, thinking about our space um, parallel here, we're getting ready to go to the moon by 2024 and Mars by 2033. I have the bumper sticker on my car. If you can think of the parallel in the deep ocean uh, to going to the moon by 2024 and Mars by 2033, it would help us. So. Yep. 
that'd be great. Um, yeah, well, we'll I want to make you a bumper sticker. <laughs> Uh, I do want to thank you all for coming this morning for your testimony and for your patience um, while we took a break to vote. I would also like to recognize Ms. Bonamici because, of course, we left our hearing to vote on, and Congress has now passed in the House, um, H.R. 1921, the Ocean Acidification Innovation Act of 2019, and that was largely due to her great work, and it is the first bill um, coming out of our, our subcommittee through the science committee. So I'm very pleased, and we passed several others this morning um, as well on the floor. So thank you very much for being here with us. Um, the record from this hearing will remain open for two weeks uh, for additional statements from members and for any additional questions for the witnesses. But you all are now excused, and the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.